Welcome to the AMDA webinar, Autophagy and its Role in Pompeii Disease. Your moderator for today's program is Dina Rabin, MD, PhD. Operator assistance is available at any time during this conference by pressing zero pound. In an answer session, will follow the presentation. You may send chat questions at any time during the presentation using the chat window indicated by a speech bubble icon located to the right of the presentation. The AMDA would like to give credit to Lucas Garrett for taking the time to research what it would take for the AMDA to host webinars for the Pompeii population instead of teleconferences. The AMDA appreciates all of Luke's hard work and dedication. Tonight's presentation is being done by webinar instead of teleconference. Thanks, Lucas. I will now turn the call over to our speaker, Dr. Rabin. You may begin. Hello, everybody. I am Nina Rabin. And before I start my talk on autophagy, I would like to acknowledge two students in our lab, Mary Barden and Amanda Wong, for helping me with this presentation. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pompe disease itself and the possible mechanism of skeletal muscle damage in this disorder. The main part of my talk will be about pathway in the cell called autophagy and its role in Pompe disease. I will go over the basics of autophagy and show evidence that this pathway is dysfunctional in skeletal muscle in both humans and in a mouse model. And finally, I will present some of our experimental data on the suppression of autophagy and its impact on therapy. Pompe disease is a rare genetic disorder. It has been reported in almost all ethnic populations, but the incidence of the disease is higher in certain ethnic groups. For example, in Dutch, in Chinese from Taiwan, and in African Americans. It is an autosomal recessive disorder, which means that two copies of the gene, one from each parent, are required to be born with the disorder. And as with all cases of recessive inheritance, children have a one in four chance of developing the disease when both parents carry the defective gene. Pompe disease goes by several names. It is called glycogen storage disease type 2, other names are acid alpha glucosidase or acid maltase deficiency and lysosomal glycogen storage disorder. Each name brings out a different aspect of the disease. The name Pompe refers to the Dutch pathologist Dr. Pompe, who first described the accumulation of glycogen in multiple tissues in a child who died from what was thought pneumonia. The disease was first described in 1932. The name acid alpha glucosidase deficiency reflects the biochemical defect. The enzyme, often abbreviated as GAA, normally degrades glycogen to glucose, and the deficiency of the enzyme leads to the accumulation of glycogen, the storage form of sugar. The name lysosomal glycogen storage disorder reflects the location of the accumulated glycogen in a specialized compartment in the cell lysosome. Lysosomes are tiny vesicles within the cells. Each lysosome is home to a large number of enzymes responsible for degrading and recycling cellular components. This enzyme functions best in an acidic environment of the lysosome. The acidification of the lysosome is accomplished by the proton pump, which is embedded in the lysosomal membrane. This membrane protects the rest of the cell from the harsh environment within the lysosome. Lysosomal rupture may kill the cell. In fact, Belgian scientist Christian de Duve, who discovered lysosomes 55 years ago, introduced the term suicide bags to describe this organelles. In Pompe disease, the lysosomes in multiple tissues become clogged with large deposits of glycogen, but skeletal and cardiac muscles are particularly 
vulnerable to this accumulation. Clinically, the disease is classified into two major forms, infantile and late onset. In its most severe form, when the enzyme is almost completely absent, the disease manifests in infants who appear normal at birth, but soon become limp and unable to move or eat. Their hearts become enlarged, and they rarely live past their first year. In milder late-onset variants of the disease, when there is still some residual enzyme activity, cardiac muscle is usually spared, but slowly progressive skeletal myopathy eventually leads to a wheelchair dependence and premature death from failure of the respiratory system. In the past two decades, we've learned a great deal about the disease. We have learned about the enzyme itself, its biosynthesis and processing. We have learned about the genetics of the disease. More than 200 mutations are now described in the gene. And we can often predict the phenotype based on the mutation analysis. Animal models of the disease have been made and the natural history of the disease is now well studied. And finally, the major breakthrough was the development and approval of the first therapy for POMPA disease, enzyme replacement therapy with recombinant human acid alpha glucosidase. The therapy has profoundly changed the natural course of the disease. The infant survives significantly longer because of the remarkable reversal of cardiac abnormalities. The problem is that many patients still remain sick because of the effect of ERT in skeletal muscle is much less impressive. We see the same phenomenon in our mouse model of the disease, a model which was developed in our lab. Cardiac muscle responds very well to therapy, but skeletal muscle does not. The work in our lab has been motivated by the need to improve the therapy and to understand why skeletal muscle is so difficult to treat. Several factors contribute to the problem. Some of these factors include the sheer mass of skeletal muscle, the misdirection of the recombinant enzyme to non-muscle tissues such as liver, the low level of the receptor on muscle cells, which is responsible for the delivery of the recombinant enzyme to the lysosome, and the immune response in patients with no enzyme activity. But above all, we simply do not know enough about the basic biology of skeletal muscle damage. In other words, it is not clear how the primary defect, accumulation of glycogen in the lysosomes, leads to profound skeletal muscle destruction. The prevailing view of the pathogenesis, which was actually put forward more than 25 years ago, is that unlike non-muscle cells, in muscle cells, lysosomes have very limited space in which to expand. This leads to mechanical pressure and lysosomal rupture. Here is a more modern version of the same concept of lysosomal rupture, showing different stages of lysosomal expansion and rupture, eventually leading to a profound skeletal muscle destruction. Although this hypothesis is valid, we in our lab think that this view is too simplistic. The reason it is too simplistic is because it does not take into account any of the downstream events which may be affected by the lysosomal expansion. The lysosomes are no longer considered simple suicide bags within the cells. They are the end point of several major pathways, which I will try to summarize on this slide. Lysosomes are the end point of the endocytic pathway, which is responsible for the degradation 
of extracellular material. This is the pathway by which the recombinant enzyme enters the cell bound to the receptor on the cell surface. The enzyme then moves to early and late endosomes, which eventually fuse with lysosome. Lysosomes are also the end point of a pathway in the cell called autophagy. Autophagy, which literally means self-eating, is responsible for the degradation of intracellular material. There are three forms of autophagy. First, microautophagy, which is direct invagination of the lysosomal membrane. This may well be a pathway by which glycogen gets to the lysosome, and I will talk about this pathway a little later. Unfortunately, we know little about this pathway or about proteins which control this pathway. The second form of autophagy is chaperon-mediated autophagy. This is a selective process by which a subset of cytosolic proteins is picked up by chaperons which deliver these proteins to the lysosome. And the third and major form of autophagy is macroautophagy, which is often referred to as just autophagy. This is the only one among the three autophagic pathways which involves the formation of a vesicle called autophagosome or autophagic vacuole. For the rest of my talk, I will focus on this pathway because we recognize that the system does not function properly in Pompe disease. In addition, this pathway is a presumed mechanism by which glycogen is delivered to the lysosomes. These are electron microscopy images of skeletal muscle from a Pompe mouse model in which the GAA gene has been knocked out. We have found that not only were the lysosomes filled with glycogen, which could not be digested, but other materials were backed up, unable to reach the recycling place. Here is a single membrane lysosome filled with glycogen, as is typical in Pompe disease. And here is an area of massive autophagic accumulation in skeletal muscle of Pompe mice. The vesicles of the autophagic and endocytic pathway interact with each other extensively, and the recombinant enzyme, which traffics, as I said before, through the endocytic pathway, can be diverted from lysosomes and trapped in the area of autophagic accumulation. We have experimental data in our knockout mouse model of the disease, which supports this hypothesis. Autophagic process starts with the formation of a double membrane, which engulfs a portion of the cell resulting in the formation of a double membrane vesicles called autophagosome. Autophagosome, as I mentioned before, fuse with vesicles of endocytic pathway, late endosome, resulting in a formation of intermediate structure called amphisome, which in turn fuses with lysosomes where the content of autophagosome is degraded and recycled. Autophagy is an evolutionary conserved survival mechanism which is activated under nutrient deprivation. When food is not available, the cell has to use its own reserves 
to stay alive until the situation improves. This is a non-selective process, a so-called bulk degradation of cellular components. However, it recently became clear that a low level of autophagy is maintained even when nutrients are abandoned. In this case, autophagy fulfills housekeeping functions such as recycling of worn out cell parts and potentially toxic protein aggregates, which are tagged by ubiquitin molecules serve, serving as an address label. Autophagy, however, is not the only pathway through which these proteins are degraded. This label can also direct the ubiquitinated protein to a pathway known as the ubiquitin proteasomal system, where the proteasome is often described as a barrel in which proteins are chopped up. Not all ubiquitinated proteins can fit into the narrow pore of the barrel. Those that cannot are broken down by the autophagic pathway with the help of a receptor, a protein called P62, which I will come back to later in the talk. Multiple proteins are responsible for different stages of autophagosomal maturation and fusion with lysosomes. I will only mention a small subset of these proteins which are relevant to our studies. One of these proteins is LC3. LC3 exist as a cytoplasmic form, LC31, which is then converted into membrane-bound LC32 form, which remains on the autophagosomal membrane, and it is shown here as little green dots throughout the whole process of autophagosomal maturation. And therefore, LC32 serves as a highly specific autophagosomal marker. The conversion of LC32 into membrane-bound LC32 protein is facilitated by the action of several proteins called ATG proteins, which stands for autophagy-related proteins encoded by ATG genes. These two forms of LC3, LC31 and LC32, can be easily separated by a technique called Western analysis. And in general, an increase in the amount of LC32 is a good indication of increased autophagy. Normally, autophagosomes quickly fused with lysosomes and LC32-positive autophagosomes can be barely detected. However, when the system is overwhelmed by an increased number of autophagosomes or when there is a problem with fusion between autophagosomes and lysosomes, the autophagosomes begin to pile up. We think that both mechanisms explain the autophagic buildup in pompe skeletal muscle. We've used a number of different techniques to monitor autophagy in pompe skeletal muscle. Electron microscopy still remains a gold standard. As you can see, typical double membrane autophagosome with undigested cytoplasmic material can easily be detected in pompous skeletal muscle. Electron microscopy clearly establishes the presence of autophagosome in skeletal muscle, but only allows us to see a very small area in skeletal muscle. In order to get at the bigger picture, other techniques are needed. Western analysis 
shows a significant increase in the level of LC32 in the knockout mice in skeletal muscle, but not in liver or in brain, suggesting that the process is very specific for skeletal muscle. An increase in LC32 levels is a clear indication of the increase in the number of autophagosomes. This method, however, does not tell us anything about the extent and location of autophagic accumulation within muscle fibers. To address this aspect, we developed in our lab a technique for staining single muscle fibers for lysosomes, autophagosome, as well as for several autophagy-related proteins. These fibers are then analyzed by confocal microscopy. Here is an image of a single muscle fiber stained for LC3. Uh, LC3. We can now visualize enlarged autophagosomes. Structure like this are never seen in normal muscle. We routinely use double staining of single fibers with LC3 and LAMP lysosomal marker so that we can visualize both autophagosomes and lysosomes within the same fiber. What you can see here is an image of a section of a fiber. Enlarged lysosomes are in green. What you can also see is a mass within the muscle fiber which is stained in both red and green. This mass is an autophagic buildup in the core of muscle fiber. And again, here is a section of muscle fiber from a young two-month-old knockout mouse. In addition to red and green within the autophagic area, you should also see some yellow spots which correspond to the area of overlap between the red autophagosomes and green lysosome. As you can see, even in young animals, autophagic buildup already occupies a significant portion of the fiber. The presence of autophagic buildup indicates that the cell disposal and recycling system does not work properly. So the substrate, which are normally eliminated by the autophagic pathway, will now accumulate. Some of this substrate, as I mentioned before, are ubiquitinated protein aggregates. If undegraded, these aggregates are likely to be toxic to the cell. The adapter protein which is responsible for the removal of these aggregates through the autophagic pathway, is the P62 protein shown here in yellow. And this protein, P62, is itself as a, is a substrate of autophagic degradation. P62 binds to ubiquitin on protein aggregates, and it also binds to LC3 molecule on the autophagosomal membrane. If autophagy is not efficient, the level of both ubiquitinated proteins and P62 go up. Indeed, we see accumulation of P62 and ubiquitinated protein in muscle fibers from knockout mice. Here is a fiber stained with lamp, a lysosomal marker, and P62. Lysosomes are in green, and P62 is in red. And here is a fiber stained again with lamp in green and ubiquitinated proteins in red. In normal fiber, you would not see any staining for P62 or ubiquitin. The presence of this substrate in fibers from the knockout mice 
points to the functional deficiency of autophagy. So a combination of electron microscopy, Western analysis, and single muscle fiber staining provide convincing evidence of abnormal autophagy in pompa muscle. But isolation of single muscle fibers for immunostaining can be technically extremely challenging, particularly in infants with the disease. The problem can be overcome by using a sophisticated technique called second harmonic generation imaging. This technique allows us to image a whole muscle bundle without any staining. By this method, the area of autophagic accumulation appear as black holes within muscle fibers. This hole Holes are filled with indigestible autofluorescent material shown here in red. As you can see, autophagic buildup is present in almost every fiber from the knockout mice. And finally, if you know what to look for, you can see the extent of autophagy, even by low resolution transmitted light microscopy, of isolated fixed muscle fibers or live fibers shown here. In this profoundly atrophic muscle fiber, you again see autophagic accumulation spanning the length of the fiber and usually located in the core of the fiber. The area grows with age and in older mice, it occupies a significant portion of the fiber. And in large lysosomes, the dark little spots in the periphery of the fiber are dwarfed by the autophagic accumulation. We have also made a mouse model of pompe disease in which autophagosomes are labeled by green fluorescent protein so that we can now monitor autophagy in live animals. The animals are anesthetized for the procedure. Here is an example of live imaging showing how ubiquitous the process is. And the question is how relevant these animal studies to the disease in humans. We had access to a limited number of muscle biopsies from both adult patients with the disease and infants on enzyme replacement therapy. In humans, we see many of the same things which are observed in mice. What is remarkable is that in many fibers from late onset patients, even more so than in mice, the autophagic buildup appears to be the only pathology in many fibers, since we do not see largely expanded lysosome outside the autophagic area. Here is a composite of several images taken along the length of the fiber. And as you can see, the extent of autophagic accumulation is really enormous. As in our mouse studies, we applied the second harmonic generation imaging to analyze muscle biopsies from late onset patients. Similar to what was observed in mice, the large area of autophagic buildup shown by arrows is filled with autofluorescent material. These images show a great variability among muscle fibers in adult patients, a well-known feature in late onset cases. As you can see, some fibers look perfectly normal. In addition to the variability among the fiber, there is also variability even within a single fiber. Here is again a composite of several images taken along the length of the single fiber. This shows that the autophagic areas, which probably begin at multiple points along the fiber, 
eventually expand, come together, and in some area, totally replace muscle tissues. And again, the expanded lysosomes seen here as dark dots outside of the autophagic area look like innocent bystanders. Autophagic buildup is also obvious in muscle biopsies taken from infants on enzyme replacement therapy. Let's go back to the animal model. We thought that if we could remove this autophagic accumulation, we may achieve several goals. First, we may reduce muscle damage. Second, we may even prevent the development of the disease if glycogen indeed gets to the lysosome through the autophagic pathway. And third, we may significantly improve the therapy. We chose to inactivate one of the critical autophagic genes, ATG7, in skeletal muscle of pompa disease. So we made muscle-specific, autophagy-deficient pompe mice, and I will refer to these mice as ATG7 knockout pompe mice. Without ATG7, LC32 is not made, and autophagosomes are not formed. As expected, both the level of LC32 and ATG7 are significantly reduced in this mice. And again, as expected, there is no autophagic buildup. Here is a fiber from ATG7 knockout pompe mouse stained with lamp and LC3. You can still see the enlarged lysosomes in green, but no autophagosomes or autophagic buildup. Importantly, the amount of glycogen in skeletal muscle of these mice was significantly reduced by 50 to 60 percent, suggesting that autophagy is involved in glycogen delivery to the lysosome. In fact, this glycogen reduction is better than what we normally see when we treat our knockout mice with enzyme replacement therapy. However, there is still some remaining glycogen in autophagy-deficient pompe mice, as shown here by biochemical data and by the fact that you can see enlarged lysosome, indicating that macroautophagy is not the only route by which glycogen enters to the lysosome. Microautophagy could be another way for glycogen to be delivered to the lysosome, as shown in this electron micrograph. Here is enlarged lysosome filled with glycogen. What you can also see here are glycogen particles which are entering the lysosome by direct invagination of the lysosomal membrane. We then treated this autophagy-deficient pompe mice with enzyme replacement therapy, and we found a remarkable decrease in the amount of accumulated glycogen to near normal levels. In this mice, lysosomes appear perfectly normal in ERT-treated autophagy-deficient mice. We have never seen this effect in pompe mice with genetically intact autophagy. It is important to emphasize that all the lysosomes are back to normal. These mice remain autophagy deficient in skeletal muscle, and there are some abnormalities associated with this condition. But these abnormalities pale in comparison to the lysosomal and autophagosomal defects in pompous skeletal muscle. In conclusion, progressive autophagic buildup is a prominent feature of skeletal muscle pathology in pompous disease. Suppression of autophagy in skeletal muscle 
results in a significant reduction of the glycogen load. A combination of suppression of autophagy with ERT leads to a near complete glycogen clearance. This successful clearance of lysosomal glycogen has never been observed in pompe mice with genetically intact autophagy, suggesting a new therapeutic approach for the disease. The concept of autophagic manipulation may also be of broader value in other diseases with dysfunctional autophagy. In fact, autophagy is involved and has been extensively studied in several major groups of disorder, including other lysosomal storage diseases, neurodegeneration, myopathies, cancer, liver disease, heart disease, infection and immunity, and in aging. Autophagy has evolved into independent discipline, and this discipline has now, uh, has now, uh, is is now uh, now has its own uh, journal and finally although this presentation has been centered around the difficulties in treating skeletal muscle in pompe disease it needs to be said that from a broader perspective the development and approval of enzyme replacement therapy represents an extraordinary achievement pompe disease is the only one among the large number of neuromuscular disorders for which an approved therapy is available. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Paul Plotz and many people in our lab and our institute, as well as people in other institutions who contributed to this project. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press 7 pound on your phone now, and you'll be placed in the queue in the order received. Please listen for your name or location to be announced, and be prepared to ask your question when prompted. You may also continue to send chat questions using the chat window to the right of the presentation. Our first question comes from George Fox. Okay, on the phone? Okay, yes, uh, I just wanted to say... Uh, Hello, George. Hi, Nina, how are you doing? I wanted to thank you for having such a uh, great presentation and, and also thank Luke for uh, getting the, uh, the webinar. This is a first for our group, and it, it really is nice to see the science as well as hear the explanation, and it was very nice. Good. Um, yeah, I, I, just, I had two questions. The first one... Uh, at the beginning of your presentation, uh, you mentioned cardiac muscle, heart muscle, yeah. and the the fact that in a lot of uh, particularly infantile patients, heart muscle seems to do seems to respond very well to treatment to ERT, and it's something I've always wondered and and hypothesized as to why, and I just wanted to hear your explanation or, or maybe a, a hypothesis you may have as to why heart muscle has always seemed to do good to uh, with ERT? I really don't have a definite answer for that, but in our mouse model of the disease, there is absolutely no autophagic accumulation in cardiac muscle, and this could be one of the reasons. Right. Okay. Okay. Another another thing is that cardiac muscle certainly gets much more enzyme than skeletal muscle. Right. It's yeah, the amount of the enzyme which enters muscle cells is much higher. It needs much less, it gets much more, and it doesn't have autophagic accumulation. Right. That, that was exactly what I thought is because it's bathed uh, in ERT during the process, and, and like you said, it, it needs less and it gets so much more. So that and gets so much more. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, my second question is: is uh, your thoughts on um, uh, the uh, the as far as suppression of autophagy using whatever 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 means it was that you used in skeletal skeletal muscle? If you would see a major problem uh, in suppressing autophagy in muscle in humans going forward? There are some data in mice, but not in humans. In mice, 
uh, autophagy is suppressed, and we have our, our control animals, the animals which serve as control for autophagy deficient, skeletal muscle specific, autophagy deficient pompe mice. The control group of mice is autophagy deficient uh, um, wild type mice. And also a couple of papers have already been published on this subject. And it is clear that there are some abnormalities associated with it, but there is no impact on lifespan, on any clinical presentation. Yes, they are a little bit more atrophic than the wild type skeletal muscle, but no major consequences of suppression of autophagy in skeletal muscle. Quite surprising, by the way. Right, which would kind of parallel in comparison to the severity of the... Severity of the uh, symptoms and the pathology in pompous skeletal muscle. It's, it's right. Okay, well, thank you very much for the presentation and the answers. You're welcome. I have a couple of questions here. So, um, <laughs> my son is undergoing ERT for pompous disease. How do we improve the therapy with autophagy? It's a very hard question for me to answer because we do the experimental studies. And unfortunately, I, do, I cannot give you a good advice. Um, so another question is, what abnormalities are observed when autophagy is suppressed? Are there noticeable symptoms or only biochemical abnormalities when muscle cells are examined. There are no noticeable system. Clinically, these mice are normal. They have a normal lifespan. However, there are at muscle atrophy. Uh, there are also some abnormalities with mitochondria because autophagy is the only pathway by which damaged mitochondria are eliminated. So there are some biochemical abnormalities, but not obvious clinical signs. I have another question. Any plans for conditional ATG7 knockout in muscle to see if autophagic accumulation can be reversed at later stages of the disease? It's a very good question. And yes, there are plans for conditional ATG7 knockout. The problem is that it takes a long time because it needs multiple mouse crosses. So I don't expect it to be. I actually started the experiments, but I do not expect the results in the, uh, you know, within a year. Okay. I also have a question, could autophagy be partly suppressed by overnight nutrition via G-tube? Again, it's a very good question for which I do not have an answer. All I can say that normally autophagy is activated in between the meals. So one would expect that during night when the, there is a big period without any uh, food, autophagy would be activated. Okay, any other questions? Um, okay, I don't have any other questions. Are there any, any, any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, to ask a live question, please press seven pound on your phone now or send your question in via chat on the right hand side. I we are often asked a question what are we doing or are we doing anything? to try to suppress autophagy, not by genetic manipulation, but by some sort of pharmacological drugs or agents. And we did try it, not very successfully. 
there are no approved drugs which would in vivo, in live animals, suppress autophagy. Another problem here is that we do not want to suppress autophagy in the whole body. The animals which we made, it's not surprising that I call them uh, muscle-specific autophagy-deficient pompe mice. So we specifically suppress autophagy in skeletal muscle, not in the whole body. The attempt to create mouse model in which autophagy is suppressed in the whole body did not result, did, were not very successful. And animals, these animals die within the first 24 hours after birth. So the idea is to specifically suppress it in a certain tissue, in this case, in skeletal muscle. And much work needs to be done to find the appropriate pharmacological agents to achieve this. Okay, I have another question. May I please have a copy of this recording? Yes, certainly you can have a copy of this recording. And I also have a question. Um, no, it's the question. Okay, are there differences between type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers in your research? In our mouse model of the disease, we do see a significant difference difference between type 1 and type 2 muscle. Type 1 muscle responds very well to therapy, similar to the response in cardiac muscle. And both cardiac muscle and type 1 muscle do not have any autophagic accumulation. So in a mouse model, it is a clear case. Type 2 muscle fibers Respond, does not respond well to therapy, and they do contain huge autophagic accumulation. In humans, it is much less clear. In a couple of cases with adult onset patients, I have a very limited number of cases, so I certainly cannot generalize. But in these uh, several cases, both type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers contained autophagic accumulation. Is there is a way we can support your research in the future? Um, I think <laughs> this is the question more to the moderator from NIH, Trish uh, Reynolds. Yes, hello. Um, NIAMS, um, the National Institute of Health, and excuse me, the National Institutes of Health as well as NIAMS do accept donations. And if someone would like more information about that, there is a section on our website, or you can email me at niamsinfo at mail.nih.gov, and you can just address that to Trish, T-R-I-S-H. We do have another live question. George Fox? Yes. Hi, Nina. I'm not very good at typing, so I figured I would just... Okay. Question. Um, the, the, thinking about it, the as far as the accumulation of autophagosomes go, uh, my guess is that it's from uh, uh, the glycogen, sort of an overload of glycogen that's not being able to be degraded. Um, have, have you uh, experimented at all with the manipulation of glycogen formation? No, George. No. No. I didn't know if you could, you know, uh, slow down the formation of glycogen if the autophagosomes may not accumulate as much, uh, and then you wouldn't have such an over, overload of the... Uh, yeah, but a couple of papers uh, had been published, and some of them are in collaboration with our group here at NIH, in which they um, suppress the genetically glycogen synthase, the enzyme which is involved in synthesis of glycogen, and they had a very, very good result. And again, it was suppression of glycogen synthesis in skeletal muscle, and it actually reversed the rescue the phenotype in this mice. So it's also a very 
um, promising uh, line of research try to suppress the synthesis of glycogen, the delivery of glycogen. But the suppression of autophagy also serves the same function since autophagic pathway delivers glycogen to the lysosome by suppressing autophagy we minimize the amount of glycogen which is delivered to the lysosome. It's already beneficial. Even we feel that it's already beneficial, even without enzyme replacement therapy. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um... Do you see much glycogen in these autophagic pools in the center of the fiber, or is the glycogen storage mostly in lysosomes? Again, it's a good question, and I don't know how much is in. There is definitely glycogen in autophagic vacuole, in double membrane autophagosome, and we have very good electron microscopy images showing glycogen particles within the autophagic vacuoles. The ratio, the amount or the balance between the amount of glycogen within the autophagosome and in lysosomes is I cannot uh, really estimate. But my guess is that it's more in the lysosome than in the autophagic poles. But the glycogen, if it is in the lysosome, it should be digestible by the exogenous recombinant enzyme. If it is in autophagosomes, I'm not so sure because the conditions within the autophagosomes are not optimal for the enzyme to digest glycogen. Okay. Are there any questions? There's one final question. Is it possible that diet could help with autophagic buildup, i.e., low carb diet? <laughs> theoretically, theoretically, it's possible, but I certainly cannot give you any clinical advice on that subject. Any other questions? Where might we find a copy of this talk? Uh, Leo, I think it's more of a question for you. Where would, uh, where could I uh, download the copy of this uh, talk? The uh, plan sponsor will communicate back with all participants. Okay. What happened to the glycogen uh, once broken down by ERC? Oh, that's the ideal situation because when glycogen Glycogen is broken by the uh, enzyme replacement by uh, GAA, by the recombinant enzyme. It is, becomes a glucose, which is utilized as an energy source by muscle. So I have an answer to one of the questions by Tiffany. Uh, the talk is being recorded and will be posted on the AMDA website. Uh, Okay. Uh, what else? Yes, again, the question, is it possible that diet could, could help? Theoretically, it is possible. But it really needs to be experimentally proven.
Any other questions? There are no further questions at this time. If there are no further questions, I think we will conclude the session. Uh, once now I have another question. Um, once the autophagic debris has accumulated, do you think that the reduction of autophagy and ERT could remove this debris? Again, this needs to, I can only speculate, they can be can remain stable and do not, and it's quite possible that on ERT they will remain stable and will not expand. If the lysosomal function is restored, there is all reason to believe that the autophagic debris will be stable, and if they are not huge, they may not even be detrimental for skeletal muscle. I don't think that ERT per se can remove the autophagic accumulation because the enzyme is not designed for this purpose. But as I said, this autophagic accumulation, if it remains stable, that would be the best possible scenario. Okay. I have the last thank you from Tiffany. Thank you, Tiffany. I hope you're doing fine. Okay, Leo, I think that that would be the end of this session. This concludes today's AMDA, Acid Maltase Deficiency Association webinar. Thank you for attending. <laughs>